as 1850, and the silence of Michigan's majestic forests were about to be shattered forever. The railroad was coming, and bringing along with it an unstoppable force, progress. Hello, my name is Chris Troy, and on this edition of Moment in History, we'll be taking a look at the railroad and the way it helped develop the St. Clair County that we know today. Funding for Moment in History is provided by Streamline Historic Services, helping clients through modern technology with old-fashioned customer service. See how Streamline can make your history work for you. Moment in History is a presentation of St. Clair County Resa with your host, Chris Troy. I'm here at the Henry Ford Museum in Dearborn, Michigan to take a look at the Allegheny locomotive. Now this locomotive was one of the largest of its time, built in 1941, weighing over 600 tons. Now the locomotives in St. Clair County weren't even half the size, yet the impact they made on the county was just as great. Before I began my journey into the history of local railroad, I decided to find out exactly what makes the old steam trains run. In order to do this, I stopped by the St. Clair County Farm Museum in Goodles, Michigan, and talked with steam engine experts and preservationists Arthur Cooney and Jim Nolan. Now, while the county's farm museum does not have a locomotive on site, they do have antique farm machinery that operate using the same principles as the old steam locomotives. Mr. Cooney was nice enough to give me a tour of the 1918 Model 1965. The first thing we need on a steam engine is water and heat. So this whole big assembly here is a boiler. And then one of the first things we do is fill it up with, with water. Now we can't overfill it or anything, so we have a gauge right there. It's called a sight, sight glass, and it will tell us how much water is in that boiler. The next thing is that we got to heat the water up to boiling, so we'll put some wood or coal, build a fire, get the fire going, and the water eventually it gets head up to, to boiling. The steam pressure builds in this whole area right here, and it will collect up here in what we call the dome. The basic purpose for that is to collect dry steam up there. And then we have a uh, throttle valve that will control the pressure from the steam dome to the engine cylinders here. Now, on a railroad locomotive, there's two cylinders. There's one on each side of the engine, both connected with the connecting rod and crankshaft. This on a railroad locomotive would be the actual drive wheels that run on the track. I recently visited the Thomas Edison Depot in Port Huron, Michigan, and sat down with local historian and author T.J. Gaffney to discuss the railroad and its impact on the county and those who resided in it. The, the first freight that the local railroads carried was uh, primarily lumber uh, initially, uh, but even bulk freight. Uh, the things that we would consider uh, carried by truck today, uh, that'd be the, the baggage, which actually uh, baggage and mail were one of the early, early contracts that the railroads had, and very, very important, obviously. Everyday goods, uh, a, a keg of nails, uh, you know, the, the uh, traditional ice box, uh, you know, every, anything that could be carried, uh, usually was carried by rail, the all, uh, all around, all weather type of travel that uh, you could uh, get your things shipped. Uh, you have to remember this was an era of uh, muddy roads that were passable if you were really lucky about two seasons of the year uh, that weren't really much more than glorified paths. And if you look at a wagon wheel, uh, they were built up high off the ground for a reason because very often they sank right up to the hubs on those. Um, and rail you know, could run in snow, could run in uh, all kinds of uh, particularly bad spring weather that uh, we often would have here. Uh, and people could guarantee that it would actually get there, which was another issue. While the railroad grew to over 600 miles of track throughout the county in 1915, so did the communities that were adjacent to it. In this particular area, um, unlike, say, the Transcontinental Railroad, it really was a case of uh, railroads went to communities. At that point in time, it really was driven by who had the money and who was willing to put forth the money. And it was less about, um, you know, constructing uh, towns along the line. That isn't to say it didn't happen. And very often, 
uh, where there would have been nothing. Um, uh, little towns uh, like Wilmot uh, and even to some extent one could argue Sandusky um, grew larger because of the fact that they were at the meeting of two crossings and Port Huron is another example of that. While Michigan and St. Clair County are known for their pioneers, the local railroad had heroes of its own, individuals whom through their finances and political sway would change the county forever. Mr. Gaffney explains. And believe it or not, there were bidding wars uh, that happened. Uh, one of the, the most memorable or, or best known is uh, when the Port Huron Northwestern Railway was being built uh, up towards the Bad Axe area. Um, there was a, a battle that went on between Lexington and Croswell about who was going to get the railroad. And uh, it came down to the influence of one gentleman, Nelson Mills, uh, called Wildman Mills back in the day, who had a real hatred of the General Lexington area and decided that he was going to put his money and his backing behind uh, the railroad going through Croswell and that's why the railroad went through Croswell. Along with Wildman Mills was Bay City, Michigan's Handy Brothers, whose empire consisted not only of lumber, coal, sugar and shipping, but a rail line as well that was quickly heading south. Port Huron's George Shuffy Jr., whose family owned the Port Huron Detroit Rail Line, explains how a strange twist of offense and a string of bad luck placed the Handy Brothers Railroad in the Duffy family hands. This is an amazing story of tragedy and turn of, of events. Everything was moving along full on full, all full cylinders for those boys. They could not do anything wrong. And that was a tough time for railroad building because as, as we all know, World War I was going on and all the materials were delegated to the war effort, so not much building was going on for railroad. They got some old Russian rail out of that uh, that uh, were, was down in Detroit. That helped the Handys because in about 1920 they put down uh, seventy-five thousand dollars to build and 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 construct this huge sugar plant down in Marine City. That was a lot of money in the 1920s dollars. And it was shortly after that that uh, the sugar market plummeted and they were left uh, with this huge debt which they couldn't support. Their house of cards started to fall apart uh, just around 1922 when the uh, lumber yard burned, the uh, introduction of Cardboard uh, made uh, producing boxes um, not much of a demand anymore. It seemed um, as though one after another uh, they went into an economic spiral. Two brothers committed suicide. By 1924, the Handy Brothers Empire was in receivership. My grandfather, James E. Duffy, he was a very prominent attorney out of Bay City and well liked by all. The um, cost uh, of the attorney's fees that my grandfather had not asked for, uh, that was the, the, the price of the railroad so that they, he took over the shares of the PHD. Before there was the St. Clair Tunnel, there were the mighty rail ferries that carried the railroad's freight across the St. Clair River. The railroad car ferries uh, actually began uh, before the uh, St. Clair River Tunnel was cut. Uh, that, uh, the, the very first of uh, the rail ferries uh, started in uh, 1871 uh, with the International and um, uh, basically continued up uh, until the, the tunnel was actually cut. At the height of operation in, in um, the, the car ferry lines um, really had two distinct periods of operation and, and if you think about the different railroads that operated them, three, uh, you had upwards of uh, three or four lines that operated the different car ferry lines. Uh, in the, the original lines that came uh, prior to the St. Clair River Tunnel, uh, 
uh, just in terms of, of the different railroads that made up what became Grand Trunk or Canadian National, there were three separate lines. Um, later on, uh, the Pierre Marquette Railway decided to start their own service, uh, uh, which ran between about 1903 and 1933. And then a new era began in the 1950s, uh, in large part because the railroad cars of the day could no longer fit in the St. Clair River Tunnel. And so the, the large auto racks and uh, larger tank cars, uh, particularly with the traffic that came from Dow Midland to their new plant, Dow Sarnia, the ferry service uh, started up again on literally a 24-hour basis. And so both the uh, then Chesapeake and Ohio Railway and uh, Canadian National Grand Trunk uh, began 24-hour uh, service that lasted right up until the new tunnel was built in 1994-95. Loading the ferries uh, was, was an interesting thing to see. Um, uh, they were loaded, you know, as you would think, with uh, steam locomotives and then later diesels. Um, but you had to be very, very careful on the aprons, which were the, the physical entities that connected the, the boat with the shore. Uh, they literally floated because of that interconnection and, and the need to move with the current, particularly in our river here. Um, and so they had what they called idler cars and usually these were flat cars or older retired uh, freight cars that had weights added to the top of them um, to, uh, to balance the ratio but they were lighter than the locomotives so that they wouldn't literally collapse the apron under the, uh, the engine's weight. Uh, the railroad car ferries uh, started out roughly in the 150 to 175 foot range and by the end, uh, with the Pure Marquette 10, uh, well, it was uh, somewhere around 300 feet long. And you don't think of it being that long, but go ahead and measure the, the dock there and you'll realize, I mean, that's 250 feet of that 300, you know, that's down there. The construction of the St. Clair River Tunnel greatly expedited the movement of freight across the, across the river. Um, if you look at pictures of the time period, uh, particularly in the area where the Thomas Edison Inn now sits, uh, there were literally lines and lines of freight cars waiting to be shipped between uh, different points because you could only at the time shift uh, about 10 to 12 cars per, per move. Uh, you can quickly see how that adds up. Also, the uh, route through the tunnel, rather than going up to Fort Gratiot and over to Point Edward, uh, actually was a much straighter uh, route and they, uh, they didn't have to uh, sit very long in between. There was a bit of a delay later on because they had to switch steam power for electric power to go through the tunnel. There was still nothing for having to wait for a backup of freight cars uh, uh, that could go on for days. The railroad not only expanded the Blue Water area, but literally broke ground by being the first railroad to tunnel under a large body of water such as the St. Clair River. Uh, the first discussions about doing a tunnel between here and Sarnia happened uh, in the early uh, 1880s. And by 1891, a new technology known as the shield technology uh, came about. Up until this point, it's important to note that there never had been a railroad that had gone underneath uh, a water uh, way of any sort. Uh, always, if you went across the waterway, you bridged it. Um, and so the, the whole concept of building a tunnel underneath the water was, was a major engineering feat. Um, there were things that had to be dealt with that no one thought about at the time that even divers have to deal with today. Things like uh, um, you know, being underneath water and being underneath the ground at that level. They had to worry about you know, what we traditionally know as the bends uh, now and uh, having to, uh, to deal with uh, having the correct ratio of, uh, of air and, and air supply and things of that nature. Uh, and that was all things, and fortunately for some that worked on that, they had to learn on the job. It was primarily a Canadian, and, and at that point, Canadian meant British uh, finance project. Uh, there was a gentleman by the name of Joseph Hobson that uh, oversaw that particular construction project. And he, uh, he understood that uh, in order to do this type of a thing, you kind of had to do it in a, in a format that um, uh, they, that uh, governments um, could not only um, not support at the level that you would support something like that today, but it had to have a very um, uh, profit-driven element to it. 
Uh, and so really it was what is now known as Canadian National, at that point it was the Grand Trunk Railway of Canada, uh, financed a majority of that through um, private bonds and what have you that, uh, that really made it happen. There was some government uh, support in terms of uh, how that those bonds got out and those type of things, but it was primarily the, the Grand Trunk Railway of Canada that, that made that happen. In November 1891, Joseph Hobson's dream became a reality as the first locomotive made its way into the St. Clair Tunnel to a celebrating Canadian crowd. While it took less than a year to complete, the St. Clair Tunnel is still considered an engineering marvel today. The St. Clair County area not only hosted the locomotives that we think of today, but other types of trains as well that kept the Blue Water area on the move. Water area trolley system not only brought convenience but brought freedom as well. On a Monday morning, one could board in Port Huron and through a series of transfers and a scenic ride along the St. Clair River, could be shopping in the afternoon at Detroit's Kearns, Federals, and Hudson's on Woodward Avenue. It must have felt as though the days had come when anything was possible. The horse drawn trolley was quickly fading into the past, being replaced with electricity and steam. New lines were popping up daily, connecting street to street and city to city. Gone were the days of the week-long journey and the rough terrain. Yes, indeed, anything was possible. It's somewhat of a, a sad commentary today that in, in the turn of the 1900s, we had more possibilities for getting back and forth from Detroit to Port Huron and vice versa than we do now. Um, it, uh, it was quite possible if you were sitting uh, in uh, Port Huron and wanted to get down to Detroit uh, that you could have done it in about four different ways. Depending on when you wanted to leave and uh, how quickly you wanted to get down there, uh, you could take uh, one of the many day boats, including the Tajmu, uh, down from Port Huron to Detroit. Uh, you could get uh, the Inner Urban. Uh, and, uh, depending on how, again, quickly you wanted to get down. You could take the uh, quick service to Detroit or you could actually stop at different resorts along the way. If one wanted to return then, uh, let's say from shopping at, uh, at Hudson's back in the day and get back up to a resort hotel, say the Windermere, um, you could do that and uh, it was not impossible to do. You could even stop along the way, say, and visit a friend at the Mount Clemens Baths uh, and get on a later uh, trolley and come back up uh, uh, to the Windermere later in the day. You actually had two specific routes that uh, the inner urban took from uh, Detroit to Port Huron. Uh, they separated at Mount Clemens area. Uh, one went up along uh, the river itself, uh, stopped at the many uh, resort communities, Pearl Beach, uh, um, St. Clair, Marine City, what have you. And then another one was more of a, a fast line, if you will, um, kind of like a, uh, a speedway uh, that uh, connected uh, and eliminated a lot of the stops between Mount Clemens and St. Clair. As they say, all good things must come to an end. By the 1980s, with the help of Congress and the Staggers Act, the dismantling of the mighty railroad was underway. The giants that once roamed the land, bringing the Industrial Revolution to America, were quickly being retired to the history books. It started uh, really with the Good Roads Movement in the uh, late teens and early 20s. Interestingly enough, it didn't get started with automobiles as much as it got started initially with bicycles. Um, people wanted to have smooth services to ride their bicycles, uh, and as the automobile then sort of grew out of that initial movement, um, the same thing sort of began to happen with automobiles. 
Um, as roads uh, began to improve, uh, the very nature of having an automobile or a motorcycle or something that was more personal made it easier for uh, people to get back and forth from place to place and so they didn't have to go down to the depot to ship out their equipment. They could you know, literally take it from one place to another. With the efforts of countywide museums, a few landmark resources have been preserved, yet there are still many that face extinction due to fire, land development, and the lack of funds to maintain their integrity. One of the artifacts that we have in this community today um, is the Thomas Edison Depot Museum and the, the baggage car actually that we're in right now. Um, both of them uh, are some of the oldest railroad artifacts in the community. Uh, the car we're in now uh, dates back to the 1870s. Uh, it was actually repaired just north of here in the original Fort Gratiot or Block I car shops. Another railroad artifact proudly displayed in St. Clair County is the Detroit Edison locomotive found in Marysville Park. The engine was donated by Detroit Edison and still remains a destination spot for families from all over the county. George Duffy recalls his family's efforts to help save this railroad treasure. Well, most people remember the Detroit Edison engines in the early 50s and 60s, and that steam engine, which is an 060 Baldwin, still operated, although in emergency service, because by then they picked up a 44-ton uh, GE engine, I believe it was, and I think a lot of people remember the ready kilowatt uh, emblem on the side of this engine. The Detroit Edison decided to donate the engine to the city of Marysville. The reason I remember it is that we had to find a way to move that engine off the main line and into the park. So we took a section of rail out of the main line and rebuilt a spur off the main line and into the park. And this was quite an operation because we had to use railroad ties and spikes and joints and put this spur right up to where the, the engine presently sits. And it was a big affair. We had dignitaries and Detroit Edison folks and the mayor of Marysville and ribbon cutting and people were pretty uh, impressed by this engine. Everybody toasted and had welcoming speeches and the section gang took up all the rail and, uh, and put the uh, main line back together again. In today's world of fast-moving transit, high-speed internet, and global communication at the blink of an eye, it's hard to imagine that once an hour-long trip meant less than a mile in journey, and that the stories of the newspapers reported were over a week old. The rail lines of St. Clair County brought more than just lumber and dry goods. They brought prosperity, and that pioneering spirit is still alive and well in St. Clair County today. I think one of the things that needs to be um, uh, understood is that while we see ourselves, for obvious reasons, because of our connection with Lake Huron and the St. Clair River and the several other rivers that run through St. Clair County, the maritime capital, um, really Port Huron in particular and several of the communities in St. Clair County, um, they might exist, but they wouldn't be at the same level that they are. They wouldn't have grown into the communities that they did without the railroad. And particularly in the case of Port Huron, um, it was as much the railroad that built the community as it was its marine connection. Um, there's several communities that had, uh, if you go up the thumb along Lake Huron, that had connections. They had docks, they had you know waterways up that way, and they never grew past the small village because they didn't have that cross connection. Um, and the, the fact that you were on a major line uh, or close to a major line that connected us directly with Chicago and Toronto uh, made us a hub point that we still are to this day, even in the interstate era. It was 1850, and the silence of Michigan's majestic forests were about to be shattered forever. The railroad was coming, and bringing along with it the blue water area we know today. I would like to thank the Henry Ford, St. Clair, Port Huron, and Bay City Historic Museums, and remind you that history lives in all of us.